Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're doing Epic History TV's World War I series 1915. Let's get into it. January 1915. World War I is just five months old, and already around one million soldiers have fallen. A war that began in the Balkans has engulfed much of the world. The Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, fight the Allies. Britain, France, Russia, Serbia and Montenegro, Belgium and Japan. In Poland and the Baltic, the Russian army has suffered a string of massive defeats, but continues to battle German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Austro-Hungarian troops have also suffered huge losses and are humiliated by their failure to defeat Serbia. In the Caucasus Mountains, Russian and Ottoman forces fight each other in freezing winter conditions. While on the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in facing the Germans, in trenches stretching from the English Channel to Switzerland. As part of the world's first strategic bombing campaign, Germany sends two giant airships known as Zeppelins to bomb Britain. They hit the ports of Kings Lynn and Great Yarmouth, damaging houses and killing four civilians. The Zeppelin raids are pretty garbage. The explosives that they're dropping at this time are not anything close to what they'll be in World War II. And so, while really the Zeppelins do more for reconnaissance and scaring the Entente to death than anything else. Britain is scared to death of what Germany might do with these Zeppelins. I mean, they are, if you read some of the writings from their political hierarchy at the time, they are so nervous about these Zeppelins, when in reality, the Zeppelins don't really have the capability to do anything crazy. I guess technically they can drop bombs, but the bombs are so inaccurate that this ends up happening. They end up killing civilians when they're going after military targets. It's it's way overblown for, for what it was at the time, but it was the first introduction to quote-unquote air raids that we would see in the future. At sea, at the Battle of Dogger Bank, the British Navy sinks one German cruiser, but the rest of the German squadron escapes. Command of the seas has allowed Britain to impose a naval blockade of Germany, preventing vital supplies, including food, from reaching the country by sea. Germany now retaliates with its own blockade. It declares the waters around the British Isles to be a war zone, where its U-boats will attack Allied merchant ships without warning. Britain relies on imported food to feed its population. Germany plans to starve her into surrender. On the Eastern Front, German Field Marshal von Hindenburg launches a winter offensive and inflicts another massive defeat on the Russian army at the Second Battle of Masurian Lakes. There's a trend that's going to happen here, and it's going to be Hindenburg... Um, oh golly, I'm blanking on the other... Ludendorff. Erich Ludendorff and Hindenburg are basically going to beat the Russians like a drum continuously until they're moved to the Western Front. Russia is not, not ready for a war of this magnitude. And once they get kind of thrust into it, they are heavily, heavily reliant on subsidies for almost everything from Britain and other allies in order to keep the war effort going. And eventually even that doesn't work. They'll collapse under the weight of it anyway. 
the Russians lose up to 200,000 men, half of them surrendering amid freezing winter conditions. The Russians have more success against Austria-Hungary. The city of Chemischul falls after a four-month siege, netting the Russians 100,000 prisoners. Austria-Hungary's total losses now reach two million. Meanwhile, the British and French send warships to the Dardanelles to threaten Constantinople, capital of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. This is hugely, hugely strategically important. There are warm weather ports that get into the Black Sea. This is essentially how this is the link for Russia during cold weather months to the outside world. And so because Germany really got the short end of the stick when they were picking allies, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire are both dying empires. These are their last breaths uh, during World War I. But the thought process is, and Winston Churchill actually is the one that pushes to open up this front. And the thought process is, if we can take the Dardanelles, then we control trade. We, we control the, essentially the Black Sea. And so then that, that maintains Russia into the war. It completely strategically blocks out the Ottoman Empire. It is a very important strategic position in the war. However, however, this is going to end up being one of the worst and worst looking offenses of the war is this push into Gallipoli. Um, it's brutal. The idea from Winston Churchill was we have all of these obsolete ships that 20 years ago ruled the waves, but now they can't compete with anything that's, you know, modernly technologically advanced from any other country. So instead of scrapping them, what we'll do is we'll just blow through the Dardanelles and we'll take the strait with all of these ships that are just going to be scrapped anyway. The admirals don't agree with that strategy. They do not want to lose these ships. And so it turns into a massive, massive shit show where everybody in Britain in the political and military hierarchy blames Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill directly lay, lays the blame at the feet of uh, the British Admiralty. They believe a show of force will quickly cause Turkey to surrender. They bombard Turkish shore forts in the narrow straits. But three battleships are sunk by mines and three more damaged. The attack is called off. On the Western Front, the British attack at Neuve Chapelle but the advance is soon halted by German barbed wire and machine guns. British and Indian units suffer 11,000 casualties, about a quarter of the attacking force. Six weeks later, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans attack with poison gas for the first time on the Western Front. A cloud of lethal chlorine forces Allied troops to abandon their trenches but the Germans don't have enough reserves ready to exploit the advantage. Soldiers on both sides are quickly supplied with crude gas masks as a chemical weapons arms race begin. Okay, so at Ypres, there's a couple of different things happening on the German perspective. One, these are not the sophisticated gas attacks that you'll see later on. These are essentially gas canisters opened up and kind of left to blow across to the enemy trenches, which works shockingly successfully to, uh, for the Germans. But the Germans were just kind of trying out a new technology here. They were not expecting this kind of success. And you can see why there's a lot of new trying out new technology back and forth. You see what works, you see what doesn't, and what works, 
then you kind of start building this plan around using it in a major offensive later on down the road. However, the line could have probably been broken here. In fact, it, it almost certainly could have been broken. But the Germans were not expecting it to be as successful as it was. They did not have troops ready to go in. And so it ends up being a lost opportunity. This is one of those things that, again, is going to leave a black mark on Germany going forward. Even though gas is going to be used by other belligerents throughout this war, this is where Germany starts off using it. The Allies land ground troops at Gallipoli, including men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, the Anzacs. Their goal is to take out the shore forts that are preventing Allied warships reaching Constantinople. But they immediately meet fierce Turkish resistance and are pinned down close to the shore. The day before the landings, the Ottoman Empire begins the systematic deportation and murder of ethnic Armenians living within its borders. The Armenians are a long persecuted ethnic and religious minority suspected of supporting Turkey's enemies. Tens of thousands of men, women and children are transported to the Syrian desert and left to die. In all, more than a million Armenians perish. The Allies condemn the events as a crime against humanity and civilization and promise to hold the perpetrators criminally responsible. To this day, the Turkish government disputes the death toll and that these events constituted a genocide. There's a legal reason why they don't do that. And it's because if it is a genocide, then you're looking at reparations, you're looking at a whole slew of like structured legal ramifications. Whereas if it's not, if it's literally anything else that sounds just as bad, but it's not a genocide, then the legal ramifications are not the same. On the Eastern Front, a joint German-Austro-Hungarian offensive in Galicia breaks through Russian defences, recapturing Chemischul and taking 100,000 prisoners. It is the beginning of a steady advance against Russian forces. At sea, the British passenger liner Lusitania, sailing from New York to Liverpool, is torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland without warning. 1,198 passengers and crew perish, including 128 Americans. US President Woodrow Wilson and the American public are outraged. But Germany insists the liner was a fair target as the British used her to carry military supplies. It was. In May, the Allies launched the second. Okay, I guess they're not going to talk about it. There's been evidence found since then it was a legitimate war target. It, it was. And so, again, this is one of those things where the propaganda on, on the side of Britain, France, and eventually, you know, the U.S. is way better than what Germany has. This is another one of those things where it looks really bad. But it's Britain kind of trying to play Germany against the rest of the world. And they did this very well with the submarine attacks from Germany because they would arm ships. They would do all sorts of stuff with the ships to make them targets. But they were still merchant vessels or civilian vessels that weren't supposed to be armed. And so if they were shot down before anybody saw or if a submarine, you know, torpedoed them, then they would just say, well, th that was just a merchant ship or that was just a civilian ship. And Germany is screaming at the top of their lungs. No, it's not. There's guns, there's arms, there's ammunition on there. It is a legitimate war target. Britain does this brilliantly throughout the war. It's one of the things that's going to drag the U.S. into it. Second Battle of Artois in another effort to break through the German lines. 
the French make the main attack at Vimy Ridge, while the British launch supporting attacks at Aubert Ridge and Festubert. The Allies sustain 130,000 casualties and advance just a few thousand yards. That summer, above the Western Front, the Fokker Eindecker helps Germany win control of the air. It's one of the first aircraft with a machine gun able to fire forward through its propeller, thanks to a new invention known as interrupter gear. Allied aircraft losses mount rapidly in what becomes known as the Fokker Scourge. Italy, swayed by British and French promises of territorial gains at Austria-Hungary's expense, joins the Allies, declaring war on Austria-Hungary and later the Ottoman Empire and Germany. The Italian army makes its first assault against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River, but is repulsed with heavy losses. Meanwhile, the Allies face a crisis on the Eastern Front. The Russians have begun a general retreat, abandoning Poland. German troops enter Warsaw on the 5th of August. Tsar Nicholas II dismisses the Russian army's commander-in-chief, Grand Duke Nicholas, and takes personal command. It will prove disastrous for the Tsar, as he becomes more and more closely tied to Russian military defeat. At Gallipoli, the Allies land reinforcements at Suvla Bay, but neither they nor a series of fresh attacks by the Anzacs can break the deadlock. Conditions for both sides are terrible. Troops are tormented not only by the enemy, but by heat, flies and sickness. In the Atlantic, a German U-boat sinks the liner SS Arabic. 44 are lost, including three Americans. In response to further US warnings, Germany ends all attacks on passenger ships. And this is the line that Germany has to walk continuously throughout this war. They are being slowly strangled by the naval blockade that Britain has implemented on them. So, in response to that, they say, okay, well, we don't have the, the ship capability to enact our own blockade on Britain, but we do have the U-boats to do that, so we'll just do the same thing. Britain's an, an island, we'll just blockade it and nothing will get through. However, they don't want the U.S. to come into the war. The U.S. has been neutral, quote-unquote, although a lot would argue they have not been very neutral, but they have not actually been fighting in the war up to this point. So Germany is saying, okay, well, what do we do here? Do we blockade Britain and actually kind of equal out the strategic naval blockades and risk the U.S. getting into the war? Or is it more advantageous to just stop the blockade on Britain and keep the U.S. out of the war? And that's kind of something that they go back and forth and back and forth on within the military and political hierarchy in Germany. It's a tough decision because either one is probably going to cost you the war. So it's, it's, a, it's a rough call. On the Western Front, the Allies mount their biggest offensive of the war so far, designed to smash through the front and take pressure off their beleaguered Russian ally. The French attack in the Third Battle of Artois and Second Battle of Champagne. The British, with the help of poison gas, attack at loss. Despite initial gains, the attacks soon get bogged down with enormous losses on all sides. Allied troops land at Salonika in Greece to open a new front against the Central Powers and bring aid to Serbia. But the Allies are too late. Bulgaria joins the Central Powers. 
and their joint offensive overruns Serbia in two months. That winter, the remnants of the Serbian army escape through the Albanian mountains. Their losses are horrific. By the end of the war, a third of Serbia's army has been killed, the highest proportion of any nation. Fierce fighting continues on the Italian front, as Italian troops launch the third and fourth battles of the Isonzo. Austro-Hungarian forces, though outnumbered, are dug in on the high ground and impossible to dislodge. In the Middle East, a British advance on Baghdad is blocked by Turkish forces at the Battle of Tesiphon, 25 miles south of the city. The British withdraw to Kut, where they are besieged. The Allies abandon the Gallipoli campaign. 83,000 troops are secretly evacuated without alerting Turkish forces. Not a man is lost. It's one of the best executed plans of the war. The campaign has cost both sides a quarter of a million casualties. 1915 is a bad year for the Allies. Enormous losses for no tangible gains. But there is no talk of peace. Instead, all sides prepare for even bigger offensives in 1916, with new tactics developed from earlier failures. All sides still believe a decisive battlefield victory is within grasp. And not only do they believe that they can get the decisive victory, but at this point, the losses have been so, so catastrophic for everybody involved that nobody is willing to just let it go. It's one of those things where, you know, you've already given so much to it that even if you know that there's going to be so much more to give, you're like, I'm already too far in. It's no longer politically tangible to pull out of. And so everybody just kind of buckles down and gets ready for the hard slog forward. Um, okay, so that was Epic History TV's World War I, 1915. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.